And another uh, good afternoon, uh, Wednesday, uh, April 15th, uh, where we find ourselves. And uh, wait, that would be tax day. <laughs> it just hit me. Uh, but anyways, hope uh, things are as good as it can be. You know, just uh, re recognize today, you know, how important it is for us to fight off anxiety, um, sadness, depression, if it's fair and fitting to, to, to use that type of term. You know, as we deal with the situation that we're in that, that just confronts different aspects of our souls and, you know, when we think about what our hope is based in and what our expectation is based in, uh, just the different things that can come against us. I think in very subtle ways, things can kind of move themselves in. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about yourself, but, uh, you know, there's a, there can be a kind of a general lethargy that overcomes us. And uh, I know for myself, uh, you know, I am dealing with allergies. And so that's always a lethargic time for me as the allergies themselves create a lethargy. Then you deal with the Benadryls and so on and so forth. And so it's tough to gauge just, just, just a reason for it. But I was just very conscious and sensitive today uh, about j just fighting that off in, in, in whatever part of it is just because of the situation that we're in. And, and nothing, nothing better than the, the person of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, uh, prayer, uh, just different things that we have in the context of God's economy that, that, that sustains us. You know, as we deal with financial questions or financial pressures, uh, you know, even even we as a church are, are dealing with financial issues. And so, so, so I'm in the same boat that you're in, in terms of not knowing what the future holds as far as just what would be normal in this in this time frame and and particularly when we're dealing with things that we normally wouldn't have to deal with but this whole idea of pandemic coronavirus and and what it confronts and and I think we're getting into that into that stage where okay at one point it was you know dealing with anxiety about the disease itself but but now where you know as the weeks and months progress it's going to be you know how this how this pandemic affects other aspects of our life but you know uh, we just have to continue to dig deep we continue to have to ba battle the the war that exists in terms of our soul in terms of that that anxiety or that you know again you, that depression ish uh, type of thing that comes uh, in us and and just recognizing the power of god uh, recognizing the places we can turn in scripture as we just are reminded of God's power, His provision, the way He takes care of His people, the way He's able to solve problems out of nowhere. And, and that, that is what, you know, kind of leads me to 2 Kings chapter 5, of all, of all places. Uh, one of the better stories, I would say, in the Old Testament, as far as just all the things that it communicates to us. And it has to do with this Gentile person, Naaman. And we were introduced to Naaman yesterday, um, and you know, saw that he was a very uh, successful person in his line of work. He was the general of the armies of Aram, and Aram was kind of a top dog, at least in reference to Israel at, at this time, uh, that they were having victories, sending skirmishes into Israel and, and getting um, the, just the different rewards that would come uh, from, from that. Um, and, and yet, in, in the midst of his success, Naaman has leprosy, and I kind of suggested that that's really... Uh, a very fitting description of the, the, the condition of mankind. In spite of our strength and our ability, there's always this weakness that exists in us. And if that leads to humility, that's a good thing, uh, to the extent that it leads us to compensate in wrong ways for those things, as the world and we even are tempted to do, you know, that's, that's the, the bad thing in terms of us forsaking the provisions of God and seeking our own provisions. But as it so happens, in one of the raids that happened into Israel, the servant girl was found, you know, was found, uh, you know, certainly there were many in the same situation that this girl found herself in Naaman's home. But as he's dealing with his leprosy, that that's got to be a topic of conversation um, in Naaman's household. She makes a suggestion in 5.3, uh, she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he could cure him of his leprosy. And, and so that's the, the witness, that's the testimony that comes from her. And so the natural result that, that comes, you know, Naaman, I, I don't think at this point he's really a believer, but in the, just the attempts he has made throughout his 
dealing with this condition. You, you, you say there's a cure here, there's a pill I can take, you have someone I can see, you know, he can wave his mumbo jumbo, uh, I'll try it because I've, I've, I'm desperate, I've, I've, I've looked everywhere. And so Naaman follows the proper protocol in terms of what he, how he would conduct himself. And so in verse 4, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. And so basically what we have in verses 4 through 6 here in 2 Kings 5 is Naaman and the king of Aram following proper protocol according to the world. What what they understood, they don't understand the power of God. They don't understand what it is to be a prophet of God, the the nature of the power, so on and so forth. But in their understanding, uh, the way kings communicate to other nations is through the other king. And, And it, because of the fact that he's in a, a king would be in control of his people, would be dictating policy, and if there is a prophet there, well, it would be the king that you would access. You know, even Naaman assembling these riches, you know, that speaks of his wealth and his success. But again, proper protocol. You're going to go to a soothsayer. You're going to go to some guy that's a healer. Well, you got to bring money, right? That's that's the racket. That's what they're all into, right? And, and so again, they're, they're operating according to the standards of the world and, and what they would understand as proper protocol. Well, we know very well that God's protocol, his procedures are much different. And later in the story, we're going to see some engagement in that and, and how Naaman has to... Um, align himself with the procedures of God rather than what he would expect and how, what he would even understand. But again, it, it just clearly shows they're, they're following proper protocol. And what I love is the juxtaposition. That's a word that I like to use if you've been involved with living hope. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite words. And, and basically what that word juxtaposition means, it means setting things side by side for the sake of comparison. And again, trying to keep these videos short, so I'm not sure how far we'll get. Uh, But what we're juxtaposing is a response of the king of Israel and Elisha, the man of God. And so therefore, in verse 7, I'll at least least read it. It says, As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robe and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? Now, this represents the person who is associated with the God of Israel, but has no relationship with him. This is most likely Joram, the son of Ahab. Ahab, one of the more wicked kings of the northern kingdom. And so, therefore, for him, not knowing the power of God, not having an established relationship with God, where that wisdom or that communication or that guidance or that power would be available, you know, he, he's freaking out, and, and, and that's kind of the state of the soul of those not connected to God. I, I think the main thing that the King of Israel shows us as believers is just understanding the benefit that comes to us in the fact that we know God. You know, that when we face circumstances that are overwhelming, this, this is an overwhelming cir- circumstance for the king of Israel. What? A more powerful king? His general is here asking me to heal him? What is he doing? Setting me up? Is he setting me up for failure? Again, all those, all those uh, mismot or, or you align motivation to people when, you, when you're afraid, when you're overwhelmed. But this is the response that, that, that comes. And it really comes as an implication of the king of Israel's relationship with God, which is none, which is nil, in, in, in terms of what he's following. You know, he recognizes he doesn't have power. Am I God? Can I kill? Can I bring people back to life? You know, assign wrong motivation. This, this must be him setting me up. Uh, but you know, juxtapose that with Elisha's response. And it says here, when, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so you see the difference? 
You see the difference of the confidence that comes from a person that, that is aligned with God, that, that had, knows his power, knows his capabilities, knows what he's, what he's able to do. What, why are you freaking out? You know, tearing the robes would be the common way of expressing stress. Um, you know, it would also be a thing of humility, um, submission. Uh, but here, it's, it's tearing his robe because he, you know, well, he's brought to an end of himself. Um, you know, he, he's thinking, again, that the, the name in, you know, Aram, the king of Aram is saying, okay, let's, let's go to the king. He's going to fail. And then because he's failed, now we have an excuse to attack him. Now we're attacking him. We're plundering and coming in to taking more for Israel because, you know, something, he didn't heal my general. That, that, that's, again, the, the, the things that, you know, how our soul gets corrupted by things that overwhelm us. You know, how, when, we're, when we're dealing with fear, um, you know, when, 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 when evil has a hold of our soul, you know, we're, we're, we're subject to that deception. We're deception to, to that judgment, to that criticism, to um, just the suspicion that, that we would have around people. And yet when we are secure in Christ, when we are secure in God, what? Why, why, are you t why are you freaking out? This is not a free reason to freak out. This is a reason to show this foreigner that there's a God in Israel. That we know his power, we know what he's able to do. So I'm not afraid. I, I, I send him along because because I can handle this. And again, that's the juxtaposition. You know, when, when we know God and we don't know God, when we're following God and we're not following God. You know, even even for us as believers, I think we can know the distinct difference between when we're connected to God, where where, where the, the His presence, the knowledge of Him. The, the, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, it, it's just the default. That as we're dealing with things that are problematic, our, our, our first reaction is not ungodly. Our reaction is godly. But what a difference between when we're not fellowshipping. Again, we're not in the Word. We're not in prayer. We're, we're not, you know, practicing the presence of God in our life. And then all of a sudden, what do we find? Isn't it true of you? I know it's true of me. Then all of a sudden that reaction is oh, fear or anger or judgment or criticism or suspicion. You know, the different things that we operate in and, and how that really is the mark on our soul. And I think that's what, that's what the lesson here is for us today, is what is the mark on our soul? Well, what, what are the circumstances of life revealing about us in terms of are we expressing calm? Are we expressing peace? Are we expressing confidence? Or, or are we like the king of, of, of Israel that, that doesn't know God and therefore the result is, is in what, what, what we see here? Uh, so again, as, as we do uh, and have to just confront our, ourselves, we, 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 we have to manage our souls. We have to manage the thoughts that are there. We need to manage the emotion that's there. We can't just assume that what the normal stasis of life, what the normal circumstance of life, and what just a normal thought pattern that we have in response to those circumstances, well, that, that, must just be more, just, that just must be what I should think. Yeah, no, not, not when those thoughts are bad. Not when those thoughts are, are, are not the confident, secured, peaceful answer that God gives. And, and that's where, you know, I believe the Bible talks about guarding our hearts or it talks about managing our souls. That, that we need to make sure that, that what is kicking around in us are the very things God would want there. And, and right here in this story, we, we see the direct implications of how that results in our lives. And I think it's indicative. I think, I think like I could, I could say, yeah, I'm the king of Israel on Tuesday and I'm the prophet Elisha on, on Wednesday, or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the king of Israel in the morning and in the afternoon, I'm the prophet Elijah. And it's that juxtaposition that we see here in the text that really is a juxtaposition for our lives. Amen. God bless you.